Well, hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Digging Deeper podcast, where our goal is to dig a little bit deeper into that week's sermon, so that way we might dig it a little bit deeper into our hearts. We are glad that y'all joined us. If y'all don't know who I am, my name is Chris Brown, and I'm the associate pastor. My name is Jacob Belding. I'm the facilities manager here. (laughs) And I'm Judah, the guy in the chair. This is week four of Jacob changing his title on us, <laughs> and so we've got outreach minister, connections minister, care master, facilities manager. What else? <laughs> Just, you got to wait till you next gotta week. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Jude is always the guy on, guy on the chair. That's right. Do you not do anything else? No, you have to hire me. No, I have to hire <laughs> you to do that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I pay you just enough to sit in the chair. That's it. Which is zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we are glad that y'all joined us here today. Um, I was going to say, did y'all watch Super Bowl? But I was with you. And so you for sure watched Super Bowl. Did you watch the Super Bowl? I watched the first quarter, Mm -hmm. and I was told it was a quarter, not an inning. So oh, yeah, that's how much I know about football. Yeah, there we go. Um, well, we're going to talk a little bit about the Super Bowl later. Um, I was going to bring up Taylor Swift, but we've talked enough about Taylor Swift. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sure we'll bring her up again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she'll she'll find her way in there. Yeah, yeah, she always see. does. Uh, anyways, she made it all the way from Japan, Chris, to make it to the Super Bowl. It's very important yeah, right. on her private jet. Um, anyway, uh, so we're, we're not going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> We are glad that y'all joined us here today. This week is a little bit different in terms of sermon right, because I get to, I, I got to preach, and so as customary, we're going to have Judah recap the sermon. Oh. What? <laughs> He's like, I'm the guy in the chair. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm just kidding, Judah. We we won't make a recap unless you want a recap. Wanna... Well, before we do anything, you have to like and subscribe. <clears throat> That's yes. right. There we go. <laughs> All right. So uh, Jacob, you yes. can bail Judah out. Uh, this time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. So the title of the sermon was Called to be Holy. And it's mm-hmm. based on 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 16. And so uh, the the points uh, for the sermon, really, it, it addressed the question of how is it that we go about becoming holy? And so the first mm-hmm. point mm-hmm. was we need to, or we prepare our minds. That's mm-hmm. the first one. The second one is uh, we set our hope. And lastly, we can form our hearts. Yeah. There you go. It's, it was easy to follow yeah, this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I give it a B. Well, I, you in, know, in your, I was, you yeah, I, was, I, I didn't feel your passion this time, <laughs> like last time. Well, let me, uh, uh, maybe let me help with that a little bit. So at the beginning, uh, your intro kind of went on and as I was listening, I'm like, did I miss a point already? Because I know that I'm going to do the recap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The podcast. So it's like, okay. And so I'm listening, listening, listening. I'm like, man, we're, uh, I don't even know how long it was, but it felt like a while without a point. Man, he is talking I, a I know, lot. Oh, he just, he's <laughs> dodgeball and, you know, these things, and uh, which I thought was a great illustration, by the way. Yes. Uh, but and then, so, you know, how do we go about becoming holy? Well, I've got three things. I go, okay, I didn't miss it. Okay. I didn't yeah, miss yeah. it. And so I was very, uh, I was very happy mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and passionate at that point that okay I was listening well there we go out. okay all right I wasn't sure at first but yeah well just keep working on it and, you know <laughs> yeah just, yeah you've got the information you just need the the zip yeah that's right yeah <laughs> yep so this week um, is in First Peter last week uh, Pastor Lee preached out of First Peter as well all about you know what does it mean to be born again and this week it was pure coincidence that that was the case it was actually um, uh, whenever I had picked this passage and started going into it, I, it was at that point that I realized, oh, Pastor Lee taught out of First Peter last week. And I was like, I really hope it's not the same passage. Like, I don't remember him mis- mentioning this passage. Uh, he actually, so, so Peter does an interesting thing in chapter one. He kind of goes full circle uh, for them. And so he opens up with this, this passage talking about how we've been born again and made alive in God. And then, goes into what I talked about of, okay, therefore, because of that, um, uh, this is now what you're called to, to holiness. And then he kind of concludes the whole thing going back to, you've been made alive and born again, which that's the passage that that Lee uh, kind of preached out of last week. And so, I almost kind of saw it as a continuation, you know, Lee 
uh, dug into, okay, what does it mean to be born again? And then this uh, uh, sermon is really more of like, okay, what are we called to now because we've been born again? Yep. Yeah. It was a good follow-up sermon. I yeah, like, I hey. tend to, just by coincidence, I tend to always do follow-up sermons to Lee's <laughs> sermons. Which is good. Yeah. It's, uh, it serves us well. It's like, yeah. okay, we've got what born again means. Mm-hmm. Well, what's next? We've been born again. It's like, oh, we should yeah. probably, you know, <coughs> respond to this call to be holy. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like mm-hmm. it. It's good. All right. Which, by the way, uh, the the title called to be holy, I didn't come up with that myself. I don't know if it's... Uh, the CSB or the ESV, uh, but that's the the subheading that yeah. it gave for it. And I was like, I, don't know, I read it, I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to use that. That works pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Yep. All right. Well, let's go. Let's read the passage, I guess. And sure. Then we'll just dive right in. So 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Which, you know, just to start out, I find that to be the funniest statement in all the Bible. Um, that that very you last be, one. You be holy. You be holy. Well, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Uh, I know it's not meant to be funny. Uh, uh, so there's a few times this is mentioned here. It's actually quoting a Leviticus mm-hmm. command, uh, and it's also mentioned. Jesus mentions it at the end of the the Sermon on the Mount. Mm-hmm. So he does the whole Sermon on the Mount, and then it's like in conclusion, you be holy, for your Father in heaven is holy. I'm like, okay, okay, like just. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, sure. Easy, like, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just, like, presented so easy. Like, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Done. I, just, I find that a little funny. <laughs> it's like, like, nice joke. <laughs> like, how? How do we do this? Right? Which, yeah. that's the sermon. Yeah. 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 Anyways. Yeah. Well, I liked, uh, I liked your dodgeball illustration. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's actually, it's a really good story. Um, now the dodge. It sounds like the dodgeball dynamics at your school growing up was a little bit different yeah. than my school growing what up. Was yours? It was an all-out onslaught the whole time. <laughs> the, the, Just the, no rules the, at all. No, I mean there were rules, but you know the athletic kids didn't hang back and wait uh, until everybody else mm-hmm. got themselves out. Yeah, uh, they were the ones that were charging the line. Yeah, the athletic race. kids. Uh, so their goal was to win, right? And so they didn't want to be caught up in all of the yeah the chaos the chaos at the beginning, and so they're like, let's just let these noobs you know get themselves <laughs> out, and then when everything calms down, then we can come in and kind of dominate. So that was kind of their yeah. their strategy. What's well, like the uh, it reminded me of uh, I think it was the first X Men movie where um, you know Magneto has his army of mutants <coughs> and uh, they're gonna go and fight against uh, the X Men. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the guys that's standing right next to uh, to Magneto like starts to run in. And he he stops him real fast. He goes in chess. The pawns go first. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much that. Uh, that's that's exactly uh, what it was like. Judah, did you play dodge? Well, you were homeschooled. So, yeah. So I was homeschooled, but. Uh, I did have a homeschool co-op that I would go to, and mm-hmm. we did play dodgeball. You did? Yes, yeah. and it was terrible. Did you I have the so foam bad. balls or the rubber balls? The rubber bar. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay good. Yeah. Maximum damage. Yeah. <laughs> we had the foam mm-hmm. ones. We, we, oh, we, y'all, the foam, that's it. We ever uh, played with the rubber ones. <laughs> I mean, and, uh, you know, while the goal uh, with uh, at, at y'all's school might have been to win the game, like, that was still the goal with us, but it was also to, like, beam each other as hard as we possibly could with those yeah, with the foam balls though it's <laughs> yeah. like even as hard as he can it's like uh, some of those guys had much. some arms really? man oh yeah so we had um i think i mentioned it so we had these it was like a variety of yeah. different dodgeballs um uh these old rubber balls and most of them were old and deflated and so hmm. you at the very least you could grip it um mm-hmm. with one hand and like get like actually get a grip on it um, there were some of them that were so deflated that you could actually like cup it like this in your your hand. Mm-hmm. So like here's the ball, and you could like cup it yep. and hold it like this, and like just get like a really good 
There's uh, some real good speed and strength behind it. Tom Brady balls. Yeah, ball, yeah, right? pretty much. Uh, <laughs> Slightly and, deflated. Man, that was some of my favorite times. Yeah. And uh, there's a correction, though. I, it may have been fifth grade, mm-hmm. not, not sixth grade. Because I think sixth grade, at some point, we moved into uh, athletics, mm-hmm. uh, where we started to go to the, the gym and, and whatnot. And so I can't remember if that's halfway through sixth grade or at the beginning of sixth grade. So it, it may have been fifth grade. Yeah. Uh, I don't yeah. remember. It's pretty close either way, close right? Enough. Within yeah. a year. Yeah. It's, yeah. Elementary, middle school. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, and the, and the whole point, right, was to illustrate that separateness. Yeah. Right, that distinctness. And so you gave us a definition of holy, mm-hmm. which is to be separate from or to be set apart. Mm-hmm. And you follow that up with, well, God is holy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is completely separate and other uh, from creation. Um, he's the creator. He's He isn't created. And so just that all by itself, right, there's this, like, gap that can't be crossed, right? Mm-hmm. There's this this void that God is creator, we're the creatures. Like, we, we can't be holy, at least in that sense, in, in the way that God is holy, because mm-hmm. he's completely separate and distinct from creation. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's not so much what uh, verse 16 is, is getting at, though, is it? No, it's getting a little bit more at the the sin, yeah, kind of separateness. That that God is good and holy and sinless, um, and you know, separate from the world in that sense. And because we've been called in Him, now we are called to be separate from sin and mm-hmm. uh, the world as well. Yep, <clears throat> and it's a uh, it is pretty amazing to think that you know uh, us in, in our sin. Right, and and in rebellion against God, that uh, He calls us uh, to be holy, mm-hmm. to be separate from, uh, you know, the rest of humanity, the rest of the world, uh, to be separate from the dominion of uh, of Satan and evil in the world, uh, and to be uh, united with Him uh, mm-hmm. in Christ. It's it's really an amazing thing if you think about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, uh, and that was kind of the whole. You know, just of the sermon, you know, the the aspect of you've been saved, not just from something, but for something. And I think that uh, a lot of times in Christianity, at least in like kind of cultural nominal Christianity, they see Christianity as a, um, you know, we're sinners and we've been saved from hell, mm-hmm. effectively. That, that that's that's Jesus' job was to save us from hell, and now. That's it. Like we're sinners, and we're always going to be sinners. And it's almost that that mindset that Paul was addressing in Romans, where it says, "Like, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound?" It's like we're Jesus has saved us from our sin anyway, so why not just keep on sinning? And and Paul, rightfully so, there and pretty much all in the Bible, is like, no. If if that's your mindset, you're missing the entire point. Right. Right. It's like like we're saved from hell. Uh, which is an element of the gospel, but we're redeemed, meaning made new, mm-hmm. ransomed, as uh, this passage later says, meaning that, that we were bought out of uh, sin. Uh, like God is trying to restore us back to what we originally were made to be. So mm-hmm. if you always go back to the, the, the garden with Adam and Eve, how did God create Adam and Eve to be? Sinless, mm-hmm. uh, in perfection, in perfect relationship with him. And it was sin that destroyed that and and threw us down a path um, uh, of sin and curse and so on and so forth. And redemption is God pulling us back to the original intent of of being in perfect relationship with Him. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's not like in the garden, and uh, we talked about this in our small group. Um, you know, if, if that's the idea, right, is to uh, get back to that same sort of relationship that we have with each other, that same sort of relationship that Adam and Eve enjoyed with God before the fall, um, there's this whole popular idea of heaven, right, that, oh, in heaven, uh, we're going to be like little angels, we'll mm-hmm. maybe have diapers on with wings, and we'll be mm-hmm. strumming harps and just chilling on the clouds, mm-hmm. and it's just, that's what it's going to be. Right, but that's not how it was in the garden. Mm-mm. Right, there was yeah. purpose that was built in the world. The world was going somewhere. Right, it's not like Adam and Eve were just called to hang out in the garden and that was it. Right? Yeah, just work, eat some work fruit. came before the fall. Yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, yeah, they were their whole 
the whole idea was, okay, as we live life today, they were called to live life mm -hmm. just in perfection. Right. Uh, were, the only difference between what they were called to do and what we're called to do is we live in a cursed world. They didn't. Right. Um, and so that throws some, some kinks in there. And if you look at the new heaven, the new earth and revelation, you know, 21, 22 and compare, like, like just go read Genesis one through three and go read revelation 22 and there's an, an amazing amount of similarities mm -hmm. between those two. Lots of the same imagery. Yeah. And, and um, kind of implying that there, there's a lot that we have to like imply or uh, speculate of in of, of what the new heaven and the new earth is going to be. But there's enough there to kind of give us the idea that, oh, God has restored Eden mm -hmm. here in yep. the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, meaning that... Yeah, we're not going to be just floating on clouds. One, it's a physical place. Right. It's described as a physical place, not a spiritual place. Mm -hmm. uh, and with uh, physical bodies, physical and bodies. Those things. Yeah, and uh, so, so the the question would be: Okay, what does new heaven and new earth look like? Um, I think a good way to get you in the ballpark of what that's going to look like is to ask yourself: Okay, what did the Garden of Eden look like? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, let's play a game of Adam and Eve never sinned. What would they have done? They would have had a family. No, that that, that part probably won't be in the new heaven, the new earth, uh, uh, the procreation part. But uh, they would have worked. Uh, they would have cultivated the garden. They probably would have developed recipes with mm -hmm. cooking. They would have made music. They would have, you know, found pastimes and hobbies. Uh, they would have probably built homes. Um, they, they, there's no reason to think they wouldn't have done those things because they would have just been living their life. Mm -hmm. Sinless and in, in perfection, and so uh, there's. I don't think you know it's up to uh, interpretation, I guess, but I don't think there's any reason to think that those things also won't be in the new heaven and the new earth. That that God has just restored us, restored the the physical earth to perfection, and we're now going to go live in that. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the big difference is you know like what you brought up is uh, procreation. Yeah, and right uh, fill the earth and subdue it right as god's image bearers uh, in the garden and uh you know presumably that comes to completion in revelation yeah um the the main reason i think that there wouldn't be procreation is because there's not marriage right. in heaven as jesus said uh when addressing the pharisees question mm -hmm. and that's one of the main purposes of marriage is procreation and mm -hmm. so if there's no marriage how do you have procreation without that right uh I could be wrong. You know, there there may be a way uh, <laughs> that, that God is is doing that. But you know, the the whole aspect of procreation in the beginning was there's only two people. Yep. We need to fill the earth, yep. and the idea being in the new heaven and the new earth, the earth is already filled. Yep. Right. And so it's 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 We're not good. necessary anymore. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. Well, and then if there was uh, procreation in the new heaven and the new earth, then you know there would be a whole generation or generations of people who hadn't experienced the redemption that's in Christ. That's true, yeah. And so, yeah, you'd effectively have people there outside of the redemption of Christ. Um, yeah, that, that would get a little, a little tricky um, theologically, mm -hmm. um, unless you wanted to go down the rabbit hole of, well, because, like, like so... Adam and Eve and their descendants, assuming they never sinned, right. would have also been sinless, sinless yeah. uh, outside of the redemption of Christ. And so they would almost fit into a completely different category mm -hmm. uh, if if that was the case, because they never um, had sin right. at all or a sinful nature. Right. Well, yeah, and they wouldn't need it because if, let's say... Uh, and now we're just having fun now, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. This, this is getting into that kind of <laughs> yeah, deep speculation. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, we more to, the theory of yeah, yeah. A speculation. Right. Uh, but I mean, it's logical, right? So yeah. if we have these redeemed new bodies that are everlasting and are sinless and perfect, um, then if there were, if there was procreation, then uh, those, right, uh, that new generation then would be sinless, like from that base of of sinless and, and perfected bodies, mm -hmm. right? But then it's, well, but what about that, uh, like they, the whole experience of salvation, right, would be foreign to them, just like it's foreign to the angels, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, like we're going to judge angels 
mm-hmm. uh, one day is what scripture says. And, mm-hmm. uh, we know things about, about God that angels w- w- would love to know. Mm-hmm. Right? Scripture tells us that as well. And so it's kind of, you know, would you have like two classes of people then? Like those that had lived in, in the present age and then those who... So it's, it does bring up a lot of questions, yeah. doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it, it would get theologically dicey yeah. um, pretty quick that you would have to have categories, um, mm-hmm. which then you would also get into no one would ever die. So eventually you, it's just stacking people on top of people on top of people on top of people. Yeah. Um, We'd colonize Mars. Finally. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> And then it gets into, okay, would these new breed class of people, would they have free will in the same way that that Adam and Eve had free will to choose or to mm-hmm. to go against. So we we start the whole process right, over again. Right. I think it's a simpler um uh, uh it's a simpler yeah, it's view simple. to hold yeah. that uh, procreation is just not necessary anymore yeah. and not there. Um again it's a little speculative, but I think you can draw a pretty good conclusion by Jesus saying there's no longer marriage. Yeah. Agreed. Um, anyways, <laughs> all that has nothing to do with the the, the sermon. Well, kinda, I, I, I think does. I think what you I think what you're getting at here is that uh, we started in holiness mm-hmm. in Adam and Eve, uh, and we're going to end in holiness in the new heaven and the new earth. And in the intermediary time that we've been saved, God is calling us to move towards that plan. Yeah. I think is that what yeah. you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's like we want to enjoy that. Uh, that state of uh, you know being re- totally redeemed, mm-hmm. right, and completely redeemed with our our new bodies in the new heaven and the new earth. Well, what's that going to look like? Right. Well, there's going to be a lack of sin. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are going to be holy uh, in that uh, way. So the question is, okay, are we living our lives in such a way that like we're heading we're heading there, yeah. or are we living our lives in such a way that would suggest that we're not? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think that's uh, that's the thing to to keep in mind when it comes to to holiness. Yeah, um, and the holiness thing it shouldn't be it should be ultimately a hard issue mm-hmm. where if you don't desire holiness, then you don't understand fully the gospel and the redemption mm-hmm. that awaits us. Which I think is why Peter's constantly pulling us back to to that aspect of you've been redeemed, you've been bought. Uh, there's an inheritance waiting for you. I think he's constantly pulling our minds to the end goal of the gospel. Um, because if you can wrap your mind around what God is calling us to, then now you'll make sacrifices today mm-hmm. to start to work your way towards that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and it's a big picture. Like uh, I really like the uh, the inheritance uh, piece in First uh, Peter one three and four. Um, that you mentioned in the sermon, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So right there, Peter's doing the same thing. He's like, hey, let's be Mm forward-looking and forward-thinking, which, uh, let's admit, is not the easiest thing to do. Mm-hmm. Right, like we're here right now, and uh, you talked a lot about you know instant gratification, and mm-hmm. um, you know this is uh, I don't know we might be the worst, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, in, in the history of mankind at yeah. me- wanting that instant gratification. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you doubt it, uh, just hang out with some kids, like little <laughs> kids, for a while. So, well, I mean, we're and I'm sure there's an element to this in, in any culture throughout history. Mm-hmm. But we have so much choice and so much accessibility and to instant gratification that, man, we're so spoiled. Um, like, like, if you just even go back in time, not even that long ago, you know, dinner was an all-day affair. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, you know, you'd have to go find what you were <laughs> going to eat, yep. kill it, you know, you spend all day, you know, carving it mm-hmm. up, getting it ready and preparing it. And if you put that meal down, uh, no one's going to say, oh, I don't want that tonight. Can we go out to eat or whatever? It's like, no, like you're lucky to even get that meal. Um, Where now um, everything is so accessible and you could either, like even if you want to cook your food, all of that's ready for you. Just go Mm -hmm. to the grocery store. You may already have it available and you just make it. but if you even didn't want to cook your food, I could drive 10 minutes and have 50 options mm-hmm. on what I want. 
And so it kind of feeds into this like um, consumeristic uh, whatever I'm feeling in that moment is what I want or or what I want to get. And so it's like, you know, in the old days, like you eat what's available and you're happy that you even got that. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I scoff at you know, burgers because I want chicken strips mm-hmm. or you yeah. know, uh, orange chicken from Panda yeah. Express or whatever. Uh, and it's just subtly feeding this this aspect of you never have to tell yourself no. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not sin to choose what you want to eat for dinner, but it's subtly building up this, I always get what I want, yeah. which then can move into sin. Yeah. Um in, in temptation, and I, I get what I want, and I get it when I want it. Yeah, right, uh, hand in hand. So my uh, my two older kids, uh, especially my son Paul, he'll uh, we'll be in the drive through, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, it's taking so long." I'm like, "Dude, we're at Chick Fil A. They're super fast. What are you talking about?" He's like, oh, "I just want to eat. They're taking so long." I'm like, kid, you have no idea. We could have went to Waterburger. <laughs> yeah, we could have sat in line for thirty minutes. Yeah. Like, it's been like we're already at the front of the line. Just mm-hmm. chill. It'll be yeah. here in a minute. Like, your fries are gonna be nice and hot. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, but uh, we can all be the same way. Oh yeah. For yeah. sure, it's not just the not just the kids, but they just amplify, right? You know, don't they? Yeah, they just have, don't have a filter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't have a filter. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> so let's get into the points. Uh, so, how do we become holy? Right. There's three steps, and the first one is to prepare our minds, mm-hmm. which is based mm-hmm. on verse 13 in First Peter one. So, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. So that's the first one. Uh, the first step in going to war with our sin mm-hmm. is prepare your minds. Um, and this is the gird your loins gird your passage, loins. right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's the footnote. Gird your loins. Don't uh, trip on your dress. Yeah. Tie it up. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's the whole thing. Um, you know, they they could have girded their loins, which, by the way, if you don't know what that, that means. Um, go watch know, the sermon. Yeah. Yeah. Go watch the sermon. <laughs> they had tunics. <laughs> Whatnot, they would, uh, so that way they wouldn't trip up on themselves. They would uh, roll up the extra material and tie it up uh, on their legs. Uh, so if they were preparing for battle, preparing for manual labor, you know, something that they're going to need agility and action uh, for, they would gird their loins. Yeah. Yep. And uh, and so they're they're ready, right? Preparing their mind, their minds for action, or, or girding their loins. Um, I also like the you know being sober minded mm-hmm. part. If I mean if you're getting ready to to do you know anything <laughs> anything worthwhile, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you better be sober minded. Yeah, you and it, right? and you know if we're sober minded can mean a lot of different yeah. things. But but let's look at it from the sober aspect. Mm-hmm. You know, let's compare it to alcohol. Um, there's times in the Bible, Baptists cover your ears. <laughs> there's times in the Bible that actually. <laughs> um, uh, encourages drinking um obviously not from a getting drunk standpoint and obviously alcohol was different back then than it was today you know the dilution rate and the hard liquor versus wine all all the different stuff i I get that um but there's times where it basically says enjoy the fruits of your labor and and uh it doesn't at the very least it doesn't discourage drinking right um but then there's times where it's like be sober minded, and I think it has to go go back to okay, what state are you living in right now? Mm. And so, if you're in a state of celebration, then you might have a good time, yeah. and and you might drink responsibly. Uh, the Bible never <laughs> encourages drunkenness, um, and I, I, I don't want to get into a whole drinking thing in the Bible, but um, <laughs> uh, but those are always in times of celebration. If you're saying be sober minded, then you're not in a time of celebration. You're in a time of readiness, right? right. In the same way that you know, if I, I, I don't know how the military works, but I assume that for uh, people in the military that are on duty at that time, or let's say paramedics who are working a shift or firefighters that are working a shift or police officers that are working a shift. I'm sure there's a policy. Don't drink alcohol, yep. right? Um, because even the littlest bit might compromise your mindset to be ready for action. Mm-hmm. And so you need to be sober minded, implying we're not in a state of celebration. We're in a state of readiness. Right. You yep. need to be sharp yep. and ready to go. Yep. And so, uh, yeah, this one, you know, it kind of, uh, 
it kind of made me think a little bit about, you know, how, uh, are, you know, are we guilty or, or how guilty are we of, of being unprepared to go to war with our sin, with just sort of tolerating our, yeah. our sin that's in our lives and just kind of, you know, sitting back and, and just kind of living with it. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, uh, you know, the, the opposite Right of what's uh, of what Peter's telling us to do here, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I mean the longer that we we sit around and and let our sin uh, continue, the longer that we uh, let it persist in our lives, right, the worse that it seems to get. Right, right, mm-hmm. and so I mean w- you know if we want to be holy, right, and here we're very clearly called to be holy as God is holy, right, mm-hmm. which is a pretty high standard <laughs> uh, for holiness. Um, yeah, it's it's going to uh, take us being intentional about it. Maybe that's what I'm trying to get at, is, is being yeah. intentional about our sin. Yeah, and there's lots of uh, Killing our verses. Sin. Killing uh, our sin. Let's see. What's that verse that says, don't, don't make provisions for the flesh? I'm trying to think of what that verse is. Um. Romans thirteen fourteen. Hmm. It says, uh, "But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires." Uh, yes, that very mindset of it's not just I'm trying not to sin, but I am actively setting up a stronghold hmm. in my life uh, to to go to war against it. And now I think that's an important. I think a lot of times we're playing defensive too much hmm. when when we need to be more offensive. And how we do it, and and so it's just like analyzing. You know, everyone struggles with different sins in their life, and and so it's analyzing. Okay, what sin do I struggle with? Okay, now what strongholds can I put up to, you know, stop that from from mm-hmm. having uh, an aspect in my life? And so, um, yeah, you know. yeah, it helps mm-hmm. to be more proactive than reactive yeah. when it comes to sin. Now, I mean, there's, I mean, we're tempted, mm-hmm, right, sure. in all sorts of different ways, and. Uh, but if we haven't thought through how we're going to respond to that temptation, right, then a lot of times we flounder that and mm-hmm. we, uh, you know, we fumble it mm-hmm. for football, yeah. Super Bowl language. Right. Um, and so uh, having, having a, like a plan or having thought through, okay, this is something that I've been having a hard time shaking. How can I go about setting up that stronghold specific for that sin mm-hmm. helps, right, whenever that temptation does yeah. come. Yeah, and uh, so I've been reading a book called... Um, Atomic Habits uh, by James Clear, I think is his name. Uh, and basically, the whole book is about okay, how, how do you how do you develop good habits and shake bad habits? And uh, there's there's four steps that that kind of walk through habit. And the first one is cue, meaning like you see something and it cues in your brain. Okay, I want to go do this. Uh, and so the idea being, if you want to set a good habit, set up like create ways for that cue. To start in your mind, um, and so if uh, I don't know if you want to, um, you know, be better about drinking your protein shake, like have the protein powder on the uh, on the counter, so that way you see it and it cues your your mind to think about it. And if let's say you don't want to have drink cokes, um, you know, keep cokes out of your house, so that way you don't see it and it cues your mind to want to drink a coke um, and diet. If it's not the house, you can't eat it. Or drink yeah, it. <laughs> right. uh, and so it's basically taking that, <coughs> that same mindset into your sin uh, is go back to like, you know, like if, you're, if your struggle is inappropriate websites. Uh, I'm not, not going to say the word because sometimes that gets flagged on yeah. um, YouTube. Uh, but inappropriate websites. Um, the cue that's leading you to those inappropriate websites probably isn't the inappropriate website itself. It's probably way back over here on something mm-hmm. seemingly um, innocent. Ben- benign. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it could be like random posts that you see on Facebook, or it could be this show that you watch that's not a bad show, but it has some elements in the show that can spark a thought in your mind that will then trace down mm-hmm. all the way to over here. And so if you're if you're asking the question of how am I going to, am I going to be serious about combating sin in my life? You can't draw the line at the inappropriate website. Right. You got to go way back over here to things that to an average person, these aren't bad things, but to you, we're not going to make a provision for the flesh. Right. So we're going to cut these things out of our lives. Um, 
that aren't necessarily sin, but they're queuing up mm-hmm. sin in our life. Yep. Yep. Agreed. And how do you do that? Prepare your mind for action. Be ready for that. Be ready. Yeah. Yeah. Be ready. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Which brings us to the second point. Mm-hmm. Set your hope. Set your hope. Yeah. We, which we kind of talked about, talked this, about a this a little bit little, earlier. Yeah. 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 That's right. Um, yeah. I might have got ahead of us a little yeah. bit. <laughs> My bad. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We already, yeah, we talked about that, uh, about the instant gratification, right? Mm-hmm. Our, our attention a lot of the time is on the present. Like, you know, when you order your Amazon and it's going to be here in two days, like normal, but then it's like, oh, something happened with the delivery. Now it's going to be another day. And it's like, this is an outrage. <laughs> <laughs> Cancel my order. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's basically just keeping your mind on that inheritance that mm-hmm. we talked about, um, which there's a lot of things wrapped up in our inheritance. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, but one of the ones that we, we talked about a lot is our holiness. And so... Um, if you're longing for the holiness that we're going to have uh, in the new heaven and the new earth, then that will cause you now to take steps to even move to that. You don't have to wait until until uh, in the new heaven and the new earth to experience a move towards holiness. Mm-hmm. Like we can start there now. Uh, that only works if you're focused on on where God has taken you. If you're focused on the here and now, you're going to give in. Yeah, uh, you're, you're just going to because, you know, uh, it's that de- delayed gratification. Uh, so you got instant gratification, delayed gratification. Uh, Dave Ramsey, I love the way he puts it. Uh, it's like um, adults devise a plan and follow through. Uh, children do what feels good. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, if you're constantly doing what feels good, then you may ask yourself, do I have a child's mindset? Um, I, I don't blame my one-year-old for throwing tantrums, it makes me mad. Uh, but I don't blame him for throwing tantrums because that's all he can see is what's in front of him and what he wants. And the goal isn't to just give him everything they wants, but to help him develop uh, a a mindset that I don't have to have everything that I want right now, but I can be disciplined and delay that gratification for a, a harvest of righteousness, yep. as the Bible says. Yep. Uh, yep. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and for kids, like I, I kind of feel bad for them uh, because you know time is like as we experience it, it's a relative thing, right? So mm-hmm. like Joni's three, and so like her lifespan is relatively has been relatively short so far, and so for her, like an hour is a relatively long amount of time, mm-hmm. right? For us, an hour is no big deal. Like I have I have very distinct memories growing up being. I don't know how old I was. I was old enough to go with my dad and my grandpa going hunting. And it's like an hour away from Weatherford to Decatur, give or take. And and so I sit in the back of the truck, you know, head against the window like this is like the longest time in my entire life. We are still in the truck. And it's like <laughs> only an hour. Mm-hmm. Right now it's like hour, that's no big deal, right? Can't even get to, you know, the other side of Dallas in an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and uh so it's, it's like four bluey episodes. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Just watch <laughs> yeah, just watch Bluey. <laughs> I used to when I was in high school, uh you know, you're sitting in class and you're like, Oh, it's twenty minutes and twenty minutes feels like forever. Especially when you're watching the clock. And- yeah. And I would think to myself, Okay, that's five times of my favorite song being played over mm-hmm. and over again. So I would just sing through that song over and over <laughs> again, five times. And I'm like, okay, if I get through this five times, the class will be done. Yeah. Like, finally at last. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, I think, uh, you know, that, that ought to get easier for us, right? As mm-hmm. we, as we go along the, uh, yeah, I mean, sure, certainly the older you get, Theoretically, theoretically, hopefully, theoretically, um, yes. hopefully you're becoming more mature, um, not just spiritually, but just physically. Mm-hmm. You're, you're just becoming more mature, and and you should be able to, as an adult, have better decision making skills than yeah. when you were a kid. Yeah. Um, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, not, not everyone's that way, um, but it, it's a muscle like anything mm-hmm. else. Uh, you, you know, obviously, there's like some physical elements to it of, you know, your prefrontal cortex and being able to, you know, to, to see further <laughs> or yeah. think further in the future than, than as of right now. And so there's obviously some, some physical elements to it in our brain that's, that's affecting that, but it's a muscle as anything mm-hmm. else. Um, it's, again, it's, 
it's thinking with the end game in mind. It's like, I don't want to go do the dishes right now, but I know that if I spend 20 minutes doing the dishes, I'll feel better mm-hmm. on the other side of this. And so I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, experience some short-term pain for some long-term reward. Um, and you just, you just slowly get better at yeah. that. Yeah, that's how I feel doing the dishes. I'm like, oh, it hurts so much. Like, <laughs> so much pain. So much pain. <laughs> um, especially when there's like milk stuck in some of the glasses. Oh, yeah. Especially the kids' glasses. I don't know. You, you may be out of this now that your kids are older, but. Oh, the bottle phase? Well, it's, uh, no, no, we're, we're past the bottle, but it's like the sippy cup where like there's like a million parts to every oh, yeah. one. We've got some of those. And I hate, um, I hate it when one of those is filled with milk. Because now milk gets into every little crevice of that whole thing. And so now it takes five minutes to wash this one uh, cup. And especially, uh, so, so the, a lot of those are like airtight ones because so they don't leak. And I hate it when there's one that's been sitting in the sink and then I open it up and there's milk in there. Uh-huh. It's like there's no telling how long this milk airtight container has been sitting in this mm-hmm. sink. Uh, and so now I, you got to like, take all that much longer to like make sure everything's cleaned out and the straw and whatnot and so it is it's some pain. pain there's some pain there yeah. Yeah. and you know some pain's not even worth it <laughs> you like, just throw it out <laughs> oh man like with uh when the kids were uh, had bottles and you know we'd have maybe an older kid you know uh or, or even when the the littles are you know old enough to like hold their own bottle or mm-hmm. whatever and then you know you get to where you're going and you're not thinking about it whatever and then, like, three weeks later, you're doing a deep clean and find that bottle, like, under the back yeah. seat. It's like... like I'm, not, I'm not cleaning nope. this. Uh-huh. It's not worth <laughs> yeah. the $3 to go buy a new one. Exactly. No, nope. yeah. that is not happening. I'm not opening that because I know what's going to hit me. <laughs> yeah. So are you saying that there's some sin that's just not worth I'm not dealing some, with no, in our lives? No, that is not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm yeah. saying sippy cups and <laughs> bottles. There are some things that aren't worth it. But, uh, no, sin, I mean, you know, the... the so for bottles, right? Like you said, three dollars, no big deal. You can just go get another one if you had to, mm-hmm. if it was going to be that bad. Yeah, and uh, you know you got to do a cost benefit analysis in your brain in the moment, and mm-hmm. it's like, oh, that one's clear. Nope, mm-hmm. I'll pay three bucks uh, for another one. Uh, well, and that, so if we were to compare that to sin and kind of the instant gratification aspect, um, like I mentioned earlier, there's some things in our lives, be it TV shows or social media or whatever, that will cue up sin mm-hmm. uh, in our life. And you got to ask yourself, is this worth the struggle? Right. And so there's some things that are just part of life. Like you just can't get away from. And so because this is a necessity in my life, I'm just going to go into this necessity prepared and ready to like stand against that Mm -hmm. temptation. And then there's other things in our life that you have to ask the question, is this worth the potential temptation? It's like, you know, if there's a TV show that's just a little bit racy uh, in its content, is it worth watching that show to potentially queue up temptation in my life, right. or is it better to just throw it out? Yeah. Right. And there we go. I, I, I connected it for yes. you. Uh, yeah. I was going a different direction, but I like Okay. That. There. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah. it's all thinking long term. Uh, yes. I do the dishes not because I love doing dishes. I do the dishes because I know short-term pain will equal long-term um, gratification. Yes. Yep. yep. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay. So this brings us to the third point. Can uh-huh. form your heart. Can form your heart. Mm-hmm. So uh, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And so the uh, uh, the whole base, right, of our holiness is God's holiness. Mm-hmm. And Peter even names us here as obedient children, mm-hmm. right? We've been adopted uh, into uh, God's family, um, and he's He's taken us in. And so it's like, you know, y- you wouldn't expect um, uh, to be, uh, you know, adopted into a particular family and then just, like, let's say that you have, you know, the way that your uh, previous family had, had done things, uh, maybe it was, maybe they were really good ways. Maybe they weren't, right? We don't mm-hmm. know. Uh, but right there, there has to be an adjustment, right, to live harmoniously with that new family, mm-hmm. right? You know, I'm talking about human adoption. Mm-hmm. Sure, it's mm-hmm. the same way yeah. here, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if we're going to uh, really be part of of God's family and, and belong, right, we got to be pursuing holiness, right? God is mm-hmm. holy, and He calls us to be holy. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, it, I think 
I think uh, the adoption is probably a, a good analogy there that, you know, maybe this kid was grew up in a very dysfunctional, like abusive, drug infested household. Mm. Right. And let's say that kid's five or six years old, and old enough to have learned some of those bad habits. Mm-hmm. And then they're brought into a functional household. Um, and uh, now that kid needs to relearn effectively mm-hmm. um, how are we going to operate. And, and ideally, you know, the, the parents come in and, you know, once the kid starts reacting the way that they were taught to react uh, in their previous life, they're like, no, no, that, that's not how, that, that's not how you should react, how um, what's going to be beneficial to react. Here's how we're going to react. And yeah, so I, I think that's a pretty good analogy there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's pretty good. It's a, uh, it's definitely one of the categories scripture gives us. So, it's like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, nailed it. It always helps when you use the illustrations yeah. that scripture actually yeah. gives you. Yeah, that's instead right. of trying to it's make like, up oh, a new one. Wow, look at yeah. that. That works really well. Crazy. <laughs> it's almost like God knew what He was doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's that element of uh, there's two things that you're conform that you can conform yourself to uh, to the world or to God um, and. There is no middle ground. You're going to go to one or the other. It's like the sin. Uh, it's like the flesh and the spirit. Um, if you're like, I'm just going to hang out in the middle and be apathetic. Um, well, if you're going to hang out in the middle and be apathetic, you're going to get pulled to your default, mm-hmm. uh, which is sin. And uh, it's like the the uh, Colossians passage where it says, you know, you've been made new, so put off the old self and put on the new self. Well, if you take off the old self but don't put on the new self you're going to put on one or the other. And so you're just going to default. Yeah. Put back on the old self. And so kind of similar thing here. It's like, you got your, your old self that you, you've been redeemed from. Mm -hmm. Uh, so now conform yourself, not to that, but to God and his holiness. That's right. Which is, uh, for our good, our ultimate good. Yeah. Right. It's not like, Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned in the sermon, uh, this past Sunday that, you know, it's not like, you know, God is giving us these commands because he's a buzzkill. Right. right? Yeah. Or, mm-hmm. Like, how dare you have fun, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you have kids, it's like you can wrap your mind around this, but then when you have kids, like, you just get such greater clarity of God's relationship to us. Like, we're the four-year-old man uh, in life. Like, you know, we're, we might be 40 years old, but in the grand scheme of things, we operate as the four-year-old. Mm-hmm. And um, as a parent to a four-year-old, uh, you are so infinitely smarter than them. Uh, it's like they, without your help, would just die. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, they would just sink into an abyss of miserableness. Um, and so you as a parent, w- what's your job is to help, one, keep them alive, but, yep. but to help them develop and see bigger than themselves but as a four-year-old, they can't see bigger than themselves. They're a four-year-old. Mm-hmm. And so they're so caught up in what they want um, that when if you even try to introduce something opposite to what they're thinking, they just kick back and rebel because they're they, they don't see, oh, you're trying to help me. They see, oh, you're trying to take away yeah. something. And I think that's just us. Like in a bigger scheme, I think it's uh, Tim Keller uh, that that made this kind of comparison of – you know, four-year-olds can't see past themselves. What if we're the four-year-old compared to God? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, so it's that mindset. And this is where the faith aspect comes in, that if you can have a deep enough relationship with God uh, to understand that he knows what's best, then when it comes to those things that you don't understand, that's when you can lean into faith and say, I don't get this, but... I know that you know more than me, so I'm going to lean on your understanding mm-hmm. and not my own. And just, I don't get it, but because you told me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And for the record, I think four is a great age. Um, mm-hmm. I remember thinking, it hit me especially with Reagan when she turned four. Uh, it started to see, uh, like, her, you know, maturity levels, you mm-hmm. know, start to go up pretty quick. Like, that year, like, I don't remember uh, exactly what, at what point uh, it was when, when she was four. I think she had been four, maybe like six months or something like mm-hmm. that. And it was like I could talk to her more like a, she's a kid mm-hmm. versus like a child, like an itty bitty, yeah. like an infant basically mm-hmm. or a toddler. Um, so that's fun. Mm-hmm. Something, to, something fun to look forward to. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Because Lottie just turned four, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's great. Uh, whenever she acts like a kid, 
man, it's great because you mm-hmm. can reason with her, and and she'll like every now and then she'll say things that are just super wise (laughs) and like if as she's dealing with jets and her little brother um she'll say something and she's like helping us parent him helping us uh uh, develop him and then there's other times she just goes the complete opposite direction (laughs) and i'm like i'm like you know judson's acting better than you are right now uh but yeah, I feel like it, four is when it kind of evens out, starts to even out. A That's little good. Bit. That's good. Yeah. It gives me some hope. Yeah, uh, Joni's on her heels too. She'll be four this summer. Yeah. I'm like, all right, come on, yeah. bring four on. <laughs> Let's get past these tantrums. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. everything's the end of the world. But. Is it? I think it's a uh, Jordan Peterson says you have to all about uh, two, three to four um, to get all of those, uh, you know, toddler behaviors out of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause past that they'll solidify, uh, mm-hmm. into the next stage of life. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something to think about. So, uh, just like we don't want to be conformed to our toddlerness, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't want to be conformed to our, our former passions, um, our, of our former ignorance, right? We want to be holy forward looking. We want to be conformed to Christ. Yeah. And, the the main thing in, you know, the verse after this that, that Peter starts to pull uh, our minds back to the Gospels, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life. I think the ESV says um, you've been ransomed from mm-hmm. your futile thinking or, or something like that. Um, I'll even like in the ESV, he flips it. So earlier he talked about that inheritance, mm-hmm. right? And in, uh, earlier in the chapter, and then in verse 18, uh, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I, like I got gotcha. you. Reversal. Yeah. Uh, so it's like which inheritance are we yeah. partaking? Yeah, in? yeah, that's neat. Uh, but yeah, it's always you know it, it's it's that pulling it back to the gospel mm-hmm. aspect of like okay, are you struggling with the heart desire to to come out of your sin? Pull your mind back to the gospel. Mm-hmm. You've been redeemed from this, not just saved from hell. Um, but you've been, you know, redeemed and bought for a price out of that. And so it's like why, uh, I think I mentioned this in the, the second service, if if I paid your mortgage today, would you keep paying the mortgage payments? No. That, that would be silly, mm-hmm. right? You're just giving away money to something that's already been paid for. And same thing with our sin. Christ has paid the debt of your sin uh, so that you might walk free, how silly it would be that we're still making payments mm-hmm. to our sin and, and still enslaving ourselves to the debtor. Um, debtor. Yeah. No, it's to, the, to the lender. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we've been freed from As that. a debtor, but yeah. yeah. Uh, as a debtor yeah. to the lender. Uh, and so, so that's the gospel in itself, that you've, it's been paid, you're free, now walk in that freeness. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, enjoy that abundant life yeah. that yeah. Christ calls us to. Yeah, and, and if given to us, and if if your mindset is, oh well, well I'm I'm saved, so I can just keep doing this. Like you're missing the whole point. Mm-hmm. The whole point is that you might walk free from this into the life that God has for you. So if you don't understand that, you need to you you need to pull yourself back to the fundamentals of the gospel and remind yourself what that is. And, and that's why I think Peter's constantly just pulling us back to, mm-hmm. okay. What's the point of the gospel? What have we been saved from? What's a, what awaits us? Yeah. Amen. All right. And uh, uh, to sort of wrap it up, you had that uh, final illustration about uh, Robert Smith mm-hmm. paying $34 million. Like, I, wish I went to the wrong school. I know, man. <laughs> I really am curious. So one of the questions I'd have for him is how many invitations did he get for a commencement speaker? Uh the next year like From, just hundreds yeah. of things and then the one that he i don't know if he did a commencement speech the next year at a school but how disappointed were they yeah um, when yeah. he didn't pay their their student loans yeah like, sorry um, guys yeah <laughs> but yeah i That's thought cool. i thought that was a really good illustration of it of you know we've racked up debt uh he's paid the debt that you might be able to start fresh and new uh and so, how again, how silly would it be all their debts paid and they go out and just keep making payments to the student loans or take out more student loans yeah. for no reason? Uh, I, I, would, I would question if they really understood 
what happened mm -hmm. if they did that. It's it's almost, um, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to like debt consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, so so let's say you have you know five cards all around you know the totaling like ten thousand dollars of debt spread over these five cards. And debt consolidators will be like, okay, instead of having five cards with five different interest rates and minimum payments and whatnot, uh, have us collect all of those into one, consolidate into one debt. So instead of five different debts, you have one debt of $10,000 with one payment. These cards are free and clear. You're now paying to one. Um, that's usually discouraged from doing. Not Like the theory of it mm -hmm. makes sense. It's usually discouraged because nine times out of ten, what will happen is they'll consolidate all the debt from these cards into one, and then just go run the cards back up. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's like when people do that, it's like I don't think you understand what's going on here. Like uh, you're trying to get out of debt, and you've shifted the debt over here, and then just went right back into debt. Right. Uh, and same thing with their sin. Jesus mm -hmm. had paid that debt, and if you're going right back into sin. You, you don't understand what's going on here. Right. Um, yeah, and I think uh, it, it's a little bit – it, it's a lot like student loan debt, right? Mm -hmm. It's really easy, right, to take out that loan whenever you're in school. Like, yeah, why would I not? Uh, mm -hmm. I need that to uh, pay tuition or to live on or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not thinking about what that means – you know, ten uh, ten years down the road, when you're still paying on it, mm -hmm. it's like you're oh. like I'm going to make fifty thousand yeah. dollars. I'll have plenty of money yeah, to, to pay out. this off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Inflation. Then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then you realize, like, when you have to, you know, actually start when you graduate, you get your degree, you get a job, and you start paying bills, and you have to pay rent or mortgage, and you turn know. 26 now you gotta pay health insurance <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. yeah health insurance or you know you start having uh, you have a, a, a wife and kids and then all of a sudden it's like now i'm still paying on this you know mm -hmm. and and so it, you know we're we're very much aware of what that debt means because we're having to pay into it mm -hmm. right and so um you know just like uh that debt and what that means and what that is right we don't have an excuse, right? We who are in Christ, because we know, like, and I think that's why there's, there's, he keeps circling back to the gospel. He calls us, you know, children, you know, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Uh, don't live in the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, uh, because, like, we, we ought to have a sense of who we are. We ought to have a sense of our sin that Christ paid for. We ought to have a sense even of God and his holiness, right? And if we have a sense of these things, I think it's a lot easier to, to get our lives in uh, in order in such a way that we are, you know, conforming our heart and preparing our minds and doing those things to go and fight sin, right? And that's why I think there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, theology here. There's a lot about God here mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, right in in the light of God and His holiness, like we're sinful, right? And it's not just like oh, whoops, whoops, messed up a little bit, right? Like it's sin is a big deal, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, right, we understand what that that sin debt means. We understand what Christ died to pay for. Right, therefore, let's let's not be friends with that sin. Mm -hmm. right? Let's go and kill it instead. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 I agree. Yeah, I like it. Yep. Good. Judy, you got anything to add? Um, talking all about student debt, Joe Biden, man. <laughs> is is he the Christ in this scenario that's going to wipe out the student debt? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, before we get into heresy, <laughs> let's wrap that up. Yeah. Well, that's the sermon from Sunday, called to be holy. Um, you've been made alive, born again. Therefore, we are to pursue holiness and become holy as God is holy. How do we do that? What's the three steps? Prepare. We prepare our minds. We set our hope, and we conform our hearts. That's it, right there. All right, we should all be holy now. Yep. Yep. We solved. Boom. We solved sin. <laughs> we did it. Good job. Good job, team. All right. Now let's move into bad doctrine of the week. It's the bad doctrine of the week. All right, Jacob. You've got a bad doctrine of the week for us today. <clears throat> what is it? Well, uh, as mentioned before, right? Uh, we may have watched the Super Bowl together. Judah caught the first qu quarter inning. Quarter. Quarter, yeah, quarter. Um, and, and this isn't something that's new as of this past Sunday, but there's this uh, this ad campaign, and it's called He Gets Us. Mm -hmm. 
And it's all about how Jesus gets us. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's just Jesus. The, Jesus gets us. us. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, they highlight the U.S. and Jesus, as in like us. We are, we are Jesus. I'm right. just kidding. That. Right. <laughs> right. That's not what they're getting at, but totally. Uh, yeah. um, yes. So the and uh, like I said, the the ads have been going. I think the first time that they aired was actually the Super Bowl a year ago. Yeah, if I remember right, that was the first yeah. time that we that I at seen least. It. Yeah. yeah. And and so even since then, with all you know, uh, anytime that I'm watching live TV, which is 99 percent of the time sports, mm-hmm. uh, I don't. There's no reason to watch live TV anymore besides yeah. really that or, or catching the news maybe. Uh, but you, every once in a while, you'll see one of those ads mm-hmm. right, that they play. He gets us, and you know, it's like, okay, what does that even mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, and it's the uh, the ads themselves are. You know, it doesn't seem like there's a really clear message, and and it's uh, it's a little confusing. At least the first, it, it is confusing. Um, so, in each ad is different. So, so they're not all made equal in terms of what they're trying to communicate. But you know, the ultimate thing that they're trying to communicate is that Jesus gets us. Like, like you know, like like you know, like you he's should, a man. Yeah, right? like, like you struggle with depression, anxiety you know, dealing with others, blah, 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 whatever it is, like Jesus gets it. And, and, like and in that understands. sense, like, yeah, he understands. And, and and in that sense, like, I think that's a good message. Um, you know, it's the, you know, Hebrews when talking about Jesus, that he has um, not been tempted as, or sorry, he's been tempted as we have been tempted. Mm-hmm. And like, like, you know, we have great high priest who can understand what we're going right. through. Um, I, I think that's a good thing to, to communicate. It's like, it's like, oh, like, uh, like I get anxious about the world. Okay, well, Jesus also got anxious about what he was called to do mm-hmm. you know, in the Garden of Eden. Um, and I, I think that's a good message in itself, that, that, that you're struggling, Jesus struggled too, and that, that he can understand you and walk you through that. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good message. Where I get off on the He Gets Us campaigns is that they and, – and they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um <sighs> They play the, they get so vague Mm -hmm. in what they're communicating that it almost can play both sides of the coin. And I think it can develop more confusion than anything. Yep. Um, And and my guess is if I was to ask them, like, hey, why why are you being so vague and potentially causing confusion? I think they would say, well, we're not trying to communicate the whole thing. We want them to go to this website, and this website's going to more clearly lay out the gospel. But let's be real. The website doesn't do that, though. Oh, it doesn't? Oh, no, I, I, I no, didn't no, even no. go to the website. No, no. Uh, um, and it's been a while since I've been on the yeah. website. But now there's not, uh, from what I remember, there's not a clear gospel presentation on their website at all. Oh, really? Okay. So that makes it even worse. Um, but let's just say for... For fun, sure. they did have the gospel on their website and a more more clarity as to what they're getting at. Um, how many people? Let's say eight million people watch it. How many are actually going to go to that website? A fraction of that. A fra- yeah. At best, a fraction of that. And so you've got a few people that are getting at best some clarity, and most of the people are um, at best confused or they're. Uh, wrong positions have been validated mm-hmm. by this. So l- let's take uh, the the one from Sunday that that you assume you want to talk about is this uh, the foot washing one? Yeah, yeah. So the that's how the commercial starts. The ad starts is hey yeah Jesus gets us and he washed feet and so it, you get a series of different uh, images or uh, they're just images I think not videos. Yes, yeah, just images. yeah, just images of different foot washing sort of episodes, right? Different mm-hmm. contexts, uh, different people doing the foot washing, and then different people getting their feet washed. Yeah, and all of them are, like, groups that are against each other, right. if, se- seemingly. So, like, one of them is, like, you know, middle-aged mom washing the foot of a, of a teenage girl in front of a Planned Parenthood. Right. You know, kind of insinuating, you know, the mom that's against abortion is washing the foot of a girl who got an abortion. Right. That's kind of the insinuation. Uh, J- Judah's got one... Uh, of this, and it's a it looks like a a guy who is homosexual uh, having his feet washed by a priest, right? Um, and the whole concept of 
of the, or I, th- I think the conclusion of the ad, it said like Jesus didn't teach hate. Right. Right. Um, and it's, I'm, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I don't appreciate the insinuation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. First off, that uh, somehow uh, it's, uh, you know, let's go with the, the, the one with the priest. Um, somehow because, you know, the scripture is pretty clear that a homosexual uh, lifestyle or the, the sin of homosexuality is uh, is in fact a sin, mm-hmm. right? Um, that you know it's hateful to say that, mm-hmm. right? I, I don't like that insinuation at yeah. all or that implication uh, from that. In which they they may come back and say, "We agree, that's not hate. Um, we're just more addressing." the inflammatory like schisms of the outside that are doing hate mm-hmm. and that there is a way to disagree and not hate like they, they could come back and say that but the but then the response would be but is that what people are walking away with right from the right. commercial yeah because okay. communication as you know goes both ways right there's mm-hmm. a communicator and then there's the audience whether it's mm-hmm. a commercial or yep. whatever it is and so if the message being sent is not the message that's being received then you have Issues, yeah, there, right? Yeah, even if even if you would have the nuance to say, yeah, you can disagree and not have hate. What the audience is going to get from this is if you disagree with them, yeah, like like, like, yeah, like they're, they're they're hating each other right now, right? And what you need to do is not hate them; you need to serve them, right? Uh, and yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so I think um, you know uh, maybe we should talk about the foot washing in mm-hmm. John thirteen when. Uh, you know, Jesus, he's, he's there. Uh, this is the, the shift in, the, in John's gospel between, uh, you know, book of signs at the beginning and uh, the book of uh, glory is the second half where uh, Jesus is preparing for uh, the crucifixion, right? And then resurrection and his glorification. And so uh, what does he do, right? He, uh, they're there, they're going to eat the Passover meal. And Jesus gets up from the table and he puts a towel around his waist and he goes around washing the disciples' feet which is uh, the role of uh, a servant, one, a low servant, right? Not mm-hmm. just uh, anybody uh, does that, right? And um, especially not somebody who's an authority figure. Uh, mm-hmm. 100% does not do that. Uh, but Jesus does, right? And he even mentions there uh, in, uh, in that gospel that, uh, like, there's more to this foot washing than just the foot washing, Right, he says, you know, uh, you guys don't totally understand what it is that I'm doing for you right now, but you're going to understand later. Right? He's he's looking forward to the crucifixion mm-hmm. uh, in that, and he says, you know, just as I have uh, served you, you know, and washed your feet, right? Wash one another's feet, serve one another. Basically, is the gist mm-hmm. of what he's getting at. Um, ironically, he also washes Judas Iscariot's feet mm-hmm. uh, as well. So. Uh, you know how that applies now to a foot washing commercial, and you know Jesus gets us, and he doesn't hate. Um, you know, it, it's not a uh, especially, and this is that's the one that gets me is he washes Judas's feet as well. Mm-hmm. It's like that's not um, that doesn't mean that you know all of you is clean, right? But Jesus is going; he does this action for him anyway. But we know where where he ended up. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, he's the son of perdition, right? He's he's damned. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, that, and then that brings up a, the question, right, fundamentally with the ad, okay, uh, let's say we are serving uh, each other, serving people with, uh, you know, that disagree with us, that even may uh, say that we hate them, right, and we're serving them anyway, right, is that going to, uh, how much good is that going to do, right, like with the ad, um, mm-hmm. you know, is it is it good to simply wash feet and then that's it? Um and I think so. I think the ad itself uh, is pretty. I, even the whole campaign is pretty like anemic. Like there's not, there's no like, there's not a whole lot behind it, and it's disappointing because mm-hmm. they're they're throwing so much money. Right, a Super Bowl ad mm-hmm. costs so much. It's like the ad could have been so much better and more powerful. Right, as as far as pointing out uh, who Christ is and what He's done for us. So like on one hand. Uh, you know, it, it does accomplish, you know, talking about Jesus in his humanity, who he is, uh, what he did, um, and those things. But if they would have focused instead on the, like this, the transforming power, right, of mm-hmm. Christ and 
really uh, the fact that he's he's saved us, right? He gets yeah. us, yeah, but he's he's also saved us. Like, how much more powerful would that have been? Yeah, well, and that's where I think this one gets off from other ones I've seen. I, I can't even tell you the other ones I've seen, but I remember the gist that I got from the other ones were, hey, are you struggling? Well, Jesus understands that, mm-hmm. and, and and he struggled also. He lived the life that we lived also, and and he understands the struggles of this world. I. I like that. Yeah. Uh, that at least, like, for people who may be unchurched and feel like God is distant, it helps people be like, okay, God's not distant. He's here with us mm-hmm. in that. And I could see a person being like, okay, Jesus gets me. Okay, let, let me seek out Jesus and have him walk with me through that. I get that. I think yeah. that's a given. This one deviates from that. Mm-hmm. It, it's less about, okay, here, let, let, me, let me help communicate that Jesus understands what you're going through and that he can walk you, help walk you through it. And it more gets into, it almost more gets into, let's bash the church yeah. um, and reinforce the minds of cultural Christianity that the church is wrong mm-hmm. and that they're hating you yeah. and that, that the church shouldn't be hating you. Mm-hmm. Um, again, they may not be wanting to say that, but I think that's what people walk away yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I'm, uh, I'm just taking the other angle, I think, mm-hmm. of... You know, so that's the negative side, right? Positively, they could have done they could have done so much better. Yeah, yeah, it could have been, uh, you know, besides just and then again, there's not like a clear there's no clear messaging, right? Mm-hmm. Other than like, okay, Jesus gets us, don't hate, right? We yeah. wash feet, don't hate, serve each other. It's like okay, there's but, no real call to action. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, because the the call to action of that one in particular is, uh, yeah, y'all shouldn't hate me, Be right? Right. And okay. Well, what, what 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 do you do with that? Right. Um, yeah. There's no next step. Yeah. There. Right. Uh, and so, uh, and, and for that reason, I'm just I'm thinking I'm sitting there watching it, and it's like there's just there's nothing really behind it to motivate anybody to go and do anything. Right. Mm-hmm. Even the I, I would even say that even the older ones, right, that mm-hmm. really do highlight that. It's like okay, so yeah, Jesus can sympathize with us. So then, what's the next step? Yeah. Right, and that's totally absent from all mm-hmm. this. Like, yeah. we'll go to him in prayer. Right, yeah. he intercedes for us, and mm-hmm. right, that's the like the actual application of it. Mm-hmm. Right, and it's it's not there. Yeah, um, I would if I was to take a, a bet, um, I would say uh, this latest one is a um, it's a marketing campaign, mm-hmm. and so it's like marketing campaigns work best when there's enough incendiary mm-hmm. uh, kind of content to cause conversation. Yep, like right? we're having now, like we're having now. <laughs> um, uh, and and so if if I was looking at it from a purely marketing standpoint, I I want to be vague, mm-hmm. and I want to be. Uh, seemingly maybe a little bit divisive because that's going to get people talking about. If I'm as clear as what you're saying, no one's going to talk about that because yeah. there's nothing to talk about. Yeah. Right? It, it's it's clear. It's clear yeah. uh, unless you're incendiary against uh, you know people enough to like make them frustrated about. It. But anyways, yeah. I think they're getting exactly what they wanted. I think I don't know. I, I tried to look it up. There's not a particular church or denomination that's that's um, funding it. Uh, the only it's like a, a bunch of different ones, and the only thing I could tie it down to was um, the the Lafayette Covenant or something like that. Um, and, uh, and the Come Near nonprofit organization. That's what it's called. Just Come uh, Near. Yeah. Hmm. Um, the the Covenant thing that I found is like a it's like a or maybe it's confession i don't know anyways it was basically like an evangelistic yeah like evangelical um kind of one and so anyways it's uh, yeah yeah uh yeah, yeah. a missed opportunity yeah, yeah. Uh, have you guys seen the uh the alternative commercial somebody put one together that they should have run uh i saw I, I saw that was there i haven't seen it yet um, it was actually but, really good yeah uh it's like that's way more impactful yeah like and then there's even conversations to be had surrounding, you know, the mm-hmm. uh, the the alternative, right? Yeah. Uh, focused on, um, like, this person is a former fill in the blank, some sort of sin, and then like now they're uh, they're a believer, they're yeah. a, a Christian, right? And then that's the whole thing. Instead of he gets us, it's he saves us, mm-hmm. and so there's this right this reversal uh, mm-hmm. that happens. And I thought it was really good. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man. 
that's what they should have shown for the Super Bowl. Like, Here's what we do. We raise up millions of dollars so next Super Bowl we can put our own commercial on there. I love it. Yeah. Great. Judah, you want to be our first investor? $7 million right here. Boom. You're pledging $7 million? Yep. Okay. <laughs> if we can raise another $200 plus his $7 million, I think we can do it. Would that cover tax? Tax? What are we paying tax on? Shipping and taxing. It's a joke. <laughs> We're creating the commercial. We're just yeah. going to take this episode and play it on the Super Bowl. That's right. Yeah. It'll just be the new halftime show. It'll be a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, what do you think? Do you think that the He Gets Us commercials are a little vague and um, confusing? Uh, or do you think they're they're good? Um, is it starting a conversation? What would you include in the uh, commercial? Would you match Judah seven million dollars, and then we can have fourteen million dollars? Hey, we'll get a minute of advertising. Yeah, all good questions. Anyways, we're glad y'all joined us. Tune in next week. We're gonna come back, and Lee's gonna be preaching, and we'll get on to whatever he's talking about. But until then, we'll see you next week. <laughs>